This is A Demonstration of Nature, written by John A. Mahung, edited and introduced by Robert D. Jones, narrated by Robert D. Jones. General Introduction by Robert D. Jones There are not many records for the life of John A. Mahung. However, he may be the French poet Jean Clopinel or Jean de Mion of Mion sur Loire. 1240-1305, who famously authored Le Roman de la Rose. Regardless of the author's obscurity, we know that the demonstration of nature was published in German in the Museum Hermeticum in 1625, and an English translation was also published by the Rosicrucian alchemist William Backhouse, 1593-1662, the mentor to the alchemist Elias Ashmore. A demonstration of nature concludes that the alchemical process is a natural process of purification that has been ordained by God and is acted out by nature. In this, Mahung tells us that the alchemist should put down written books and instead study nature if a true understanding of the synthesis of the philosopher's stone is to be understood. Much of his text is an open conversation with the reader, God, and Mother Nature. He asks more questions than he answers, likely in an attempt to show the reader that the true mystery of alchemy is held secret by nature and that one must experience the journey to unveil the answer. From what he does tell us though, it is understood early on that the true alchemical process is not that of physical chemistry. He says, I know that no credit is to be attached to the fanciful notions of the old sages who would prepare our stone out of a crude metallic substance. And... Unto you I render the most heartfelt thanks, for you have delivered me from my own ignorance and from the disgrace and ruin to which all my endless alembics, quicksilvers, aquafortes, dissolutions, excrements of horses and coal fires must at length have brought me. With the assurance that Mahung is not discussing chemistry, we can understand that the alchemy he is discussing is of a spiritual or psychological manner. He tells us that there are only two stages that concern the alchemist. The first is the preparation of the first substance which will become the seed of the matter from which the philosopher's stone will be made, and the second is keeping the fire alive to fuel the process. Beyond these two steps, he leaves the rest to nature's capable hands. In regards to the preparation of the first matter, he says, Chaos or Heil is the first substance. Mahung uses the term heil purposefully, as it is a term he would have understood from the work of Aristotle. In Aristotelian philosophy, heil is a term used to describe the principal drive that causes material change. So the first substance from which the matter will be synthesized is that which causes change. Perhaps we could read that as the changes and events that humanity experiences during the everyday living. If we look at this through the lens of psychoanalysis, we might assume that the key events are those that are traumatic, for in them are golden lessons to be learned that fuel the transmutation of the mind, body and soul. Mahung leans into this idea and says, The only thing in which man must aid you, nature, is by preparing the substance, removing all that is superfluous, enclosing this simple earth which is combined with its water in a vessel, and subjecting it to the action of gentle heat in a suitable alembic. These alchemical terms are symbolic, and intuition might lead the reader to understand that the alchemist is the vessel and alembic, the falsehoods of the ego of a superfluous substance to be removed, the truth of the event is the earth, the alchemist's emotion is the water, and consciousness is the fire. Mahung then states, once the vessel is enclosed in the female vessel, no further trouble or work or any kind is required. Everything is brought to perfection by your gradual and silent working, and the generation of the stone, you say, is performed in a similar manner. The female vessel he speaks of is the unconscious mind which is impregnated by the conscious will. If the first steps in purifying the trauma, event or first substance are undertaken correctly, then the seed of consciousness will be pure, the impregnation of the unconsciousness will be true, and nature will ensure 
but the resulting berth is golden. Front piece. A demonstration of nature, made to the erring alchemists and complaining of the sophists and other false teachers, set forth by John A. Mahung. Nature Speaks Good heavens, how deeply I am often saddened at seeing the human race, which God created perfect in his own image and appointed to be the lords of the earth, depart so far away from me. I allude more particularly to you, O placid Philophaster, who presume to style yourself as a practical chemist, a good philosopher, and yet are entirely destitute of all knowledge of me, of the true matter and of the whole art which you profess. For behold, you break vials and consume coals, only to soften your brain still more with the vapours. You also digest alum, salt, orpiment, and atrament. You melt metals, build small and large furnaces, and use many vessels. Nevertheless, I am sick of your folly, and you suffocate me with your sulphurous smoke, which most intense heat you seek to fix with your quicksilvers. With most intense heat you seek to fix your quicksilver, which is the vulgar volatile substance, and not that out of which I make metals. Therefore, you affect nothing. For you do not follow my guidance, or strive to imitate my methods rather mistaking my whole artifice. You would do better to mind your own business than to dissolve and distill so many absurd substances and then pass them through alembics, kirkabitas, stills, and pelicans. By this method, you will never succeed in congealing quicksilver. For the revivification, you use a reverberatory fire and make it so hot as to render everything liquid. Thus you finish your work and in the end ruin yourself and others, you will never discover anything unless you first enter my workshop where, in the innermost bowels of the earth, I ceaselessly forge metals. There you may find the substance which I use and discover the method of my work. Do not suppose that I will reveal my secret to you unless you first find the growing seed of all metals, resembling that of the animals and vegetables. I preserve in the bosom of the earth both that which is used for their generation and that with which they are nourished by. Metals exist, vegetables live and grow, and animals feel, which is more than merely to grow. I make metals, stones, and the atramental substances out of a certain elements, which I mix and compound in a certain way. These elements you must seek in the heart of the earth and nowhere else. Vegetables contain their own seed and image. In like manner, animals are propagated, and by the same means do generate their own likeness. Everything proceeds by the laws laid down for it. Only you, wicked man, who try to usurp my office, have departed further from me than any other creatures. Metals have no life or principle of generation and growth, if they lack their own proper seed. The first is accomplished by the four elements in nine days, the moon goes through the twelve heavenly signs in twenty-nine and a half days. By the aforesaid laws, winter and summer relieve each other. The elements are changed, and generations take place in the earth. Through my working, through the working of God and the heavens, do all things subsist, the perceptible, the visible, and the invisible. Thus all things in heaven, which are comprehended under the moon, do work and impart their influence to the substance, which, like a woman, longs to conceive seed. Each star influences its own substance according to its peculiar nature. They produce different things. They work first in heaven above, then in the earth beneath in the elements, each according to its own peculiar virtue, and hence arise species and individual things. You are to know that these manifold influences do not pour themselves fruitlessly upon the earthly elements, for though their work is invisible, it is a most certain and real thing. The earth is surrounded by heaven, and from it obtains her best influences and substances. Every sphere is ready to communicate its truth, and therewith to pervade her centre. Through this motion and heat, there arise upon earth vapours, which are the first substances. If the vapour is cold and moist, it sinks down again to the earth, and is there preserved. That which is moist and warm ascends to the clouds. That which is shut up in the earth I change, 
after a long time into the substance of sulfur, which is the active, and into quicksilver, which is the passive principle. The metals are another mixture of the first composition. The whole is obtained from the four elements which I form into one mass. This process I repeat so often that you have no excuse for a mistake. After the putrefaction comes the generation, which is brought about by the internal incombustible warmth, heating the coldness of the quicksilver, which gladly submits to this heat because it wishes to be united to its sulphur. All these things, fire, air and water, I have in one alembic in the earth. There I digest, dissolve and sublime them without any hammer, tongs, file, coals, vapour, fire, bath of St. Mary or other sophisticated contrivances. For I have my own heavenly fire which excites the elemental according as the matter desires to put on a suitable and comely form. Thus I extract my quicksilver from the four elements of their substance. This is always accompanied by its sulphur, which is its second self, and warms it gradually, gently and pleasantly. Thus the cold becomes warm, and the dry moist and oily, but the moist is not without its dry substance, nor is the dry without its moist. One is conserved by the other in its first essence, which is the elementary spirit of the essence or the quintessence, from which proceeds the generation of our child. The fire brings it forth and nourishes it in the air, but before that it is decomposed in virgin earth. Then water flows forth, or it flows forth from the water, which we must seek since it is my first matter and the source of my mineral. For contrary resists strenuously to contrary, and in this the wise fortifies itself unless by chance it is carried away in the operation. Then it suffers transmutation and is stripped of its form by the lust of matter which constantly attracts a new form. By my wisdom I govern the first principle of motion. My hands are the eighth sphere, as my father ordained. My hammers are the seven planets, from which I forge beautiful things, the substance out of which I fashion all my works and all things under heaven, I obtain from the four elements alone. Chaos, or Hyle, is the first substance. This is the mistress that maintains the king, the queen, and the whole court. A horseman is always ready to do her bidding, and a virgin performs her office in the chambers. The more beautiful she is, the more beautiful I appear in her. Know also that I have power to give the essence to all essences, but it is I who preserve them and mould them into shape. Moreover, observe the three parts from which God has divided the first substance. Of the first and purest part, he created the cherubim, seraphim, archangels, and all the other angels. Out of the second, which was not so pure, he created the heavens and all that belongs to them, of the third, impure part, the elements and their properties. The first and best of these is fire. Fire admits no corruption and contains the purest part of the quintessence. After fire, he made the subtle air and put it into a part, but not so large a part, of the quintessence. Then came the visible element of water, which has as much of a quintessence as it needs. Last of all comes the earth. All these, like all the rest of nature, he created in a moment of time. The earth is gross and dark, and though it is fruitful, yet it contains the smallest part of the quintessence. At first the elements remained as they were in their separate spheres. So air is really moist, but is properly tempered by fire. Water is really warm, but it obtains its moisture from the air. The earth is really dry, but it is also cold. Its great dryness renders it akin to fire. Fire, however, is the first of the elements which causes life and growth through its heat. Now all these elements influence and qualify each other so that each in its turn is now active, now passive. For instance, fire works upon air and earth. Earth is the mother and nurse of all things and sustains all that is liable to decay under heaven. Now God has given me power to resolve the four elements into their quintessence. This is that first substance which in every element is generically qualified. I resolve them for my own purpose and thereby bring about all generation. 
but no one will be able to resolve me into my first substance, as he strives to resolve the elements. For I alone can transmute the elements and their forms, and he who thinks otherwise deceives himself. For you will never be able to assign to each substance its proper influence or to find the correct proportions of the elements which are required by that substance. I alone, I say, can form created things and give to them peculiar properties and substance. By my heavenly mysteries, I produce perfect works, which are justly called miracles, as may be seen in the elixir which has such marvellous virtue and is of my forming. No art upon earth can add anything to or improve upon my workmanship. Every sane person must see that nothing can be accomplished without a perfect knowledge of the heavenly bodies, or apart from the efficacy which abides in them. Without these, everything is error and misuse. And yet, from where can a mere man obtain this influence, and how is he to apply it to the substance? How can he mingle the elements in their right proportions? Even if a man were to spend a long life in the investigation of a secret, says Avicenna, he would not get any nearer to its solution. It is entrusted to my keeping alone, and can never be known to any man. By my virtue and efficacy, I make the imperfect perfect, whether it be a metal or a human body. I mix its ingredients and temper the four elements. I reconcile opposites and calm the discord. This is the golden chain which I have linked together of my heavenly virtues and earthly substances. I accomplish my works with such unerring accuracy that in them all my power is shown forth, and with so much skill that the wisest of men cannot attain to my perfection. Go forth then, and behold my works. You who think yourself so skilled a workman, and without any knowledge of me, with your coal fires and your St. Mary's bath, strive to make gold potable in my alembics, and know that I cannot bear the sight of your folly. Are you not ashamed, after considering my works, to attempt to rival them with your foul decoctions in your coloured and painted vials, and thus lose both your time and your money? I am at a loss to conceive what you can be thinking. Have pity upon yourself and consider my teaching. Try to understand rightly what I tell you, for I cannot lie. Consider how that most glorious metal, gold, has received its beautiful form from heaven and its precious substance from the earth. The generation of the precious stones, such as carbuncles, amethysts and diamonds, takes place in the same manner. The substance itself is composed of the four elements, its form and qualities it receives through heavenly influences, although the capacity of being thus wrought upon slumbers in the element and is only brought out and purified in the course of time. All this is accomplished by my hands alone. I am the architect, and no one else knows the secret of life. For however wise he may think himself, he does not know how much to take of each element, or where to obtain it, or how to mingle hostile elements to allay the discord, or how to bring the heavenly influences to bear on these essences. He cannot even make iron, lead, or the very basest of metals. How then should he be able to make gold except by stealing my treasure? The object that he desires can be accomplished by my art alone, an art that is impossible for man to know. And even though we allow gold to be the most precious of metals, Gold by itself cannot cure diseases, heal the imperfections of other metals, or change them into gold. In the same way, glass, which might otherwise be the philosopher's stone, can never become so soft as to be rendered malleable. Gold alone is the most precious and the most perfect of all the metals. But if you cannot even make lead, the minutest grain of any metals, or produce the fruit of any herb, how hopeless must your search after the art of making gold appear? Again, if you say that you wish to produce some chemical result, even if it do not turn out to be gold, I answer that you thereby only give fresh proof of your folly. Can you not understand that the secret of my innermost work must always remain a sealed book to you? What nature does can never be successfully imitated by any created being. Nay, if I make gold out of seven metals and you do not understand my method, how can you ever hope to prepare the substance which itself changes all metals into the purest gold and is the most precious treasure that God has given me? 
You are foolish and ignorant if you do not know that this precious thing which you seek is, to the created mind, the greatest mystery of nature, and that it is a compounded by heavenly influences, and thus has the power to heal and deliver men from all diseases and to remove the imperfection of the base metals. If, therefore, it is in itself so perfect that it has no likeness upon earth, it must surely be the workmanship of the highest intelligence, since no one else can even make gold, and certainly not produce a thing which has itself the power of making money. Surely, to maintain that you can prepare such a thing is like saying that you cannot carry ten pounds, but that you are strong enough to carry a hundred pounds. Put to heart, therefore, the true scope and responsibility of your intent. I myself, again, receive all my wisdom, virtue, and power from heaven, and my matter, in its simplest form, is the four elements. This is the first principle and the quintessence of the elements, which I bring forth by reductions, time, and circulations, by which I transmute the inferior into the more perfect, the cold and dry into the moist and warm, and thus I preserve stones and metals in their natural state of moisture. This is brought about by the movements of the celestial bodies, for by them the elements are ruled, by their controlling influence, like is brought to like. The purer my substance is, the more excellent the results produced by the heavenly influence. And do you think that there, in your Alembic, where you have your earth and water, I will be induced by your fire and heat and by your white and red colour, to bend my neck to your yoke and to do your will and pleasure? Do you think that you can move the heavens and force them to shed their influence upon your work? Do you think that that is an organic instrument which gives forth sweet music only when it is touched by the musician's fingers? You take too much upon yourself, you foolish man. Do you not know that the revolutions of the heavens are governed by a mighty hand which, by its influence, imparts power to all things? I beseech you to remember that all great things proceed from me, and in the last instance, from God and not to suppose that the skill of your hands can be as perfect as the operation of nature, for it is void and vain and ape-like, must imitate me in all things. Nor must you suppose that your distilling, dissolving and condensing of your substance in your vessel, or your eliciting of water out of oil, is the right way of following me. Far from it, my son. All your mixing and dissolving of elements never has produced and never can produce any good result. Do you wish to know the reason? Your substance cannot stand the heat of the furnace for a single half hour, but must evaporate in smoke or be consumed by the fire. But the substance with which I work can stand any degree of heat without being injured. My water is dry and does not moisten what it touches. It does not evaporate or become less. Neither is its oil consumed. So perfect are my elements, but yours are worse than useless. In conclusion, let me tell you that your artificial fire will never impart my heavenly warmth, nor will your water, oil, and earth supply you with any substitute for my substance. It is the gift of God, shed upon the elements from heaven, and upon one more than upon another. But how is known only to me and to the great artist who entrusted me with the knowledge? One thing more let me tell you, my son. If you would imitate me, you must prepare all out of one simple, self-contained matter, in one well-closed vessel and in one alembic. The substance contains all that is needed for its perfect development and must be prepared with a warmth that is always kept at the same gentle temperature. Let me ask you to consider the birth and development of man, my noblest work. You cannot make a human body out of any substance whatsoever. Of my method, in forming so subtle a body, neither Aristotle nor Plato had the remotest knowledge. I harden the bones and the teeth. I make the flesh soft, the muscles cold, the brain moist, the heart, into which God has poured the life, warm, and fill all the veins with red blood. And in the same way, I make of one quicksilver and of one active male sulphur, one maternal vessel, the womb, of which is the alembic. Man indeed aids me with his art, by shedding external heat into the matrix. More than this, however, he cannot do. He then that knows the true matter, 
and prepares it properly in a well-closed vessel, puts the hole in an alembic and keeps up the fire at the proper degree of warmth, may safely leave the rest to me. Upon the fire all depends, and it is therefore your greatest responsibility to see to that. Consider therefore the fire, which they call epicin, pepsin, peporsin, and optesin, or natural, preternatural, and infranatural fire, which burns not. Without the true matter and the proper fire, no one can attain the end of his labour. I give you the substance. You must provide the mere outward conditions. Take then a vessel and an alembic of the right kind and size. Be wise and perform the experiment in accordance with my laws. Help me and I will help you. I will deal with you as you deal with me. To my other sons, who have treated me well, have obeyed their father and mother and submitted themselves to my precepts. I have given a great reward, as John de Mahung, for instance, will tell you. His testimony is also born out of Villanova, Raymond, Morianus, the Roman, Hermes, whom they call father and who has not his like among the sages, Geber, and others who have written about this art and know by experience that it is true. If you, my son, wish to prepare this precious stone, you need not put yourself to any great expense. All that you want is leisure and some place where you can be without any fear of interruption. Reduce the matter, which is one, to powder. Put it, together with its water, in a well-closed vessel and expose it to continuous, gentle heat, which will then begin to operate while the moisture favours the decomposition. The presence of the moisture prevents the dryness of the quicksilver from retarding its assimilation. Meanwhile, you must diligently observe what I do and remember the words of Aristotle, who says, Study nature and carefully peruse the book concerning generation and corruption. You must also read the book concerning heaven and the world, in which you will find indicated the beautiful and pure substance. If you neglect the study, you will fail. On the subject, consult Albertus Magnus's De Mineralis. But if your eyes are opened by such studies, you will discover the secret of the growth of minerals in that they are all produced from the elements. First, learn to know me before you call yourself master. Follow me. That is the mother of all things created, which has one essence, and which can neither grow nor receive a living soul without the heavenly and elementary influences. When you have learned by persevering study to understand the virtues of the heavenly bodies, their potent operations, the passive conditions of the elements, and their reason, if you further know the media of transmutation, the cause of generation, nutrition, and decay, and the essence and substance of the elements, you are already acquainted with the art, notwithstanding that a most subtle mind is still needed for the studying of my operations. But if you do not possess part at least of this knowledge, you will be fortunate indeed if you succeed in discovering my secret. It is a secret that is read not by those that are wise in their own conceits, but by those that humbly and patiently listen to my teaching. Therefore, if you desire to know this treasure, which has been the reward of the truly wise in all ages, you must do as I bid you. For my treasure has such virtue and potency that the like of it is to be found neither in heaven nor upon the earth. It holds an intermediate position between mercury and the metal, which I take for the purpose of extracting from it, by your art and my knowledge, that most precious essence. It is pure and potable gold, and its radical principle is active humidity. Moreover, it is the universal medicine described by Solomon. The same also is taken from the earth and honoured by the wise. God has assigned it a place among my mysteries and reveals it to the sages, although many who call themselves learned doctors of theology and philosophy hold it in ignorant contempt, as alchemy is also despised by the doctors of medicine because they do not know me and are ignorant of that which they profess to teach. They must be insufficiently furnished with brains, or they would not direct their foolish scorn against the panacea which renders all other medicines unnecessary. 
Happy is the man, even though he be sinking under the weight of years, whose days God prolongs until he has come to the knowledge of his secret. For as Geber says, many to whom this gift was imparted late in life have, nevertheless, been refreshed and delighted by it in extreme old age. He that has this secret possesses all good things and great riches. One ounce of it will ensure to him both wealth and health. It is the only source of strength and recreation, and far excels the golden tincture. It is the elixir and water of life, which includes all other things. In my treasure are concealed quicksilver, sulfur, incombustible oil, white, indestructible and fusible salt. I tell you frankly that you will never be able to accomplish its preparation without me, just as I can do nothing without your help. But if you understand my teaching and cooperate with me, you can accomplish the whole thing in a short time. Be done with the charlatans and their foolish writings. Be done with all their various alembics and vials. Be done with their excrements of horses and all the variety of their coal fires, since all these things are of no use whatever. Do not perplex yourself with metals or other things of a like nature. Rather, change the elements into a changeable form. For this is the most excellent substance of the sages, and is rejected only by the foolish. Its substance is like, but its essence unlike, that of gold. Transmute the elements, and you will have what you seek. Sublime that which is the lowest, and make that which is the highest the lowest. Take quicksilver, which is mixed with its active sulphur. Put it into a well-closed vial, on one dilemmic, plunge one third of it into the earth, Kindle the fire of the sages, and watch it well, so that there may be no smoke. The rest you may leave to me. I ask you to do no more, but only bid you to follow my unerring guidance. The answer of the chemist, in which he confesses his errors, asks pardon for them, and returns thanks to nature. Dearest Mother Nature, who... Next to the angels is the most perfect of all God's creatures. I thank you for your kind instruction. I acknowledge and confess that you are the mother and empress of the great world, made for the little world of man's mind. You move the bodies above and transmute the elements below. At the bidding of your Lord, you accomplish both small things and great, and renew the face of the earth and the heavens by ceaseless decay and generation. I confess that nothing can live without a soul, and that all that exists and is provided with the being flows forth from you by virtue of the power that God has given to you. All matter is ruled by you, and the elements are under your governance. From them you take the first substance, and from the heavens you obtain the form. That substance is formless and void until it is modified and individualized by you. First you gave it a substantial and then an individual form. In your great wisdom, you cunningly mould all of your works through heavenly influences, so that no mortal man can utterly destroy them. Under your hands, God has put all things that are necessary to man, and through you, he has divided them into four kingdoms, namely, those that have being and essence, like the metals and stones, those that have essence and growth, like the vegetables, those that have feeling and sensation, like the beasts, birds, and fishes. These are the first three classes. In the fourth, it pleased God to place only the noblest and most perfect of his works namely man, to whom he also gave a rational and immortal soul. This soul is obscured by the defilement which found its way into the body through the senses, and, but for the grace and mercy of God, would have become involved in his condemnation. Hence the chief perfection of man is not derived from you, nor do you impart to us our humanity. Nevertheless, the material part of man is the work of your hands alone. And surely our bodies are cunningly and wonderfully made, and in every part of them bear witness to the masterly skill of the workman. How marvellous are the uses of our various members! How wonderful that the soul can move them and set them to work at will! But alas, more often the body is the master of the soul, and forces it to do many things which pure reason condemns. 
If we consider the matter from this point of view, it seems as though you had begun well, and yet your work had, after all, turned out to be an abortion. Were you wanting in wisdom or knowledge, or could you not do otherwise? Pardon me if I speak too presumptuously about your wisdom. I only desire to be rightly and truly informed. For indeed, even now your stern rebuke has made many things clear to me. I have spent my whole life attending to your lessons, and the more closely I have listened, the more clearly have I understood my mistakes and the depth of your wisdom. Now, whether I lie, stand, or walk, I can think of nothing but your great mystery, and yet I am unable to conceive what substance and form I must take for it. You did sternly rebuke me for not following your way, but you know that if I do not obey you, it is only because I do not know what you would have me do. I shall never be able to attain any satisfactory result in this art unless you enlighten my blindness. You have rightly said that it is not for man to know the mystery of your work. How then can I be guided to this knowledge unless you take me by the hand? You say that I must follow you, and I am willing to do so. But tell me what I must do, and what books I must study for that purpose. Of the books which I have read, one says, do this, and the other, no, do that. And they are full of unintelligible expressions and dark parables. At last, I see that I cannot learn anything from them. Therefore, I take refuge with you and instantly beseech you to advise and tell me how to set about this difficult task. On my knees, I implore you to show me the way by which I can penetrate into the lower parts of the earth, and by what subtle process I am to obtain the perfect mercury of the metals. And yet I doubt whether any man, even after obtaining this mercury, can really make gold. That is your work and not the work of man, as your words and my own experience most clearly show. We see that the cold and moist mercury needs the assistance of its sulphur, which is its seed after its kind, or its homogeneous sperm, out of which the metal or stone must be produced. But you say only, take the proper substance, the proper vessel, the proper mineral, the proper place, and the proper fire. Then form colour, and life will grow and spring forth from that. You are the architect. You know the glorious properties of a matter. The active principle can do nothing unless there is a passive principle prepared to receive its influence. You know how to mix the warm and the cold, the dry and the moist. By reconciling hostile elements, you can produce new substances and forms. For I did indeed understand all that you told me, but I am unable to express it as well as you. You have firmly impressed on my mind that the elixir is composed by the reconciling and mutual transmutations of the four elements. But what man is sufficient for such a task? For who knows how earth can have its essence in common with air, or how it can be changed into moisture which is contrary to its nature? For humidity will not leave a cold and humid element, not even under the influence of fire. This, too, is the work of nature, that it comes black, white, and red. These three visible colours correspond to the three elements, earth, water, and fire, and are pervaded by the air. Then, again, you say that the stone is prepared of one thing, of one substance in one vessel, the four elements composing one essence, and which is one agent which begins and completes the work. Man, you say, need do nothing but add a little heat, and leave the rest to your wisdom. For all that is needed is already contained in the substance, imperfection, beginning, middle, and end, as the whole man, the whole animal, the whole flower, is contained each in its proper seed. Now in the human seed, the human specific substance is also included as flesh, blood, hair, etc., and thus every seed contains all the peculiar properties of its species. In the whole world, men spring from human seed, plants from plants, and animals from animals. Now I know that once the seed is enclosed in the female vessel, no further trouble or work of any kind is required. Everything is brought to perfection by your gradual and silent working. And the generation of a stone, you say, is performed in a similar manner. Only one substance is required, which contains within itself air, water, and fire. In short, everything that is needed for the completion of this work. 
No further handling of any kind is necessary, and a gentle fire is sufficient to rouse the internal warmth, just as an infant in the womb is cherished by natural heat. The only thing in which man must aid you is by preparing for substance, removing all that is superfluous, and closing this simple earth which is combined with its water in a vessel and subjecting it to the action of a gentle heat and a suitable alembic. This, you say, is all that needs to be done by man. When all has been prepared for you, you begin your part of the work. You dissolve the substance and make the dry watery. Then you sublime it and bear it upward into the air, and thus, without any further aid, bring that to perfection which can itself impart perfection to all imperfect things. Therefore, you, nature, are the first mother, since you cunningly combine the four elements into an essence, by a process of which none but you has any knowledge. I have understood you this far, but I do not quite despair of seeing your great reward with my own eyes, if it pleases God and yourself. But at present, I earnestly desire to know but one thing, and that is, how can that substance be obtained? What are its qualities, and what are its powers to impart perfection to imperfect things? I am well aware that gold is the most precious of metals, but I cannot see that it has any capacity of becoming more potent than it already is. For whatever man may do with it, it will never be able to perfect anything but itself. If anyone told me to dissolve it and extract from it its quicksilver, I should regard that as a very foolish direction. For nothing can be got out of gold but what is in it. These philophastes betray their ignorance by saying that they can reduce gold to its first substance. But your instruction has made it clear to me that the first substance cannot be obtained except by destroying the specific properties of a thing. Nor can any new species be brought forth by such destruction unless the species be first universalized into the genus. Moreover, I make bold to affirm that no man can first resolve gold into its generic substance and then restore it again, for when it has once lost its specific properties, no mere human skill can change it back into what it was before, nor can anyone really reduce gold to the first form imparted to it by the elements, for gold is not transmuted either by heat or by cold, and is so perfect that fire only renders it purer. It does not admit to any further development, and therefore no other metal or quicksilver can be obtained from it. Indeed, plants and animals are constantly producing their like by means of their seed, and their capacity for organic nutrition. But I do not see how the same can be said of metals, seeing that at the expiration of any given period, they still retain the same size and weight which they had at the beginning. Through you, they receive their being out of the elements without any sowing, planting, or development of any kind. Moreover, I know that no credit is to be attached to the fanciful notions of the old sages who would prepare our stone out of the crude metallic substance, and do not understand that the form and substance of a thing are conditioned by its essential nature. Now, I remember a certain juggling charlatan who was looked upon as a great philosopher telling me that the only true material was common quicksilver, which must be well mingled with gold, since in such a union the one brought the other to perfection. If I did this, continued that impostor, I should be able to prepare the elixir. First, however, the four elements must be separated from each other. Then, after each had been purified, they must be reunited, the great being combined with the small and the subtle with the gross. This, he said, was the right way of making the stone. But I know that all this is sheer nonsense, and that such men are only deceiving themselves and others. I am also aware that only God can produce anything out of the elements. He alone knows how to mingle and combine them in their due proportions, for he alone is the creator and author of all good things, and there is nothing in the world that he has not made. Therefore, let the charlatans cease their vainglorious talk, and remember that they can never hope together where they cannot sow. 
Let them make an end of their false calcinations, sublimations, and distillations, by which they extract the spirit in a vaporous form, and of their juggling coagulations and congelations, by which they pretend, even among the initiated, to be able rightly to separate the elements of gold and quicksilver. It is certainly true that all things under heaven are composed of the four elements, and mixed of them according to the due proportion of their genus and species. But it is not simply the union of the four elements, but their being combined in a certain way, which constitutes the substance of a philosophical stone. I also understand that in the red, quicksilver and perfect body, which is called the sun, the four elements are combined in a peculiar way and so inseparably conjoined, that no mere human art can divide them. For all ancient and true sages say that fire and air are enclosed in earth and water, and contend so violently with each other that none but God and nature can loosen their grappling embrace. This I can truly affirm and also prove, for we can neither see the fire nor grasp the air, and if anyone says that the several elements can be seen, he is an impostor, seeing that they are inseparable and inextricably conjoined. For although the sophists pretend and confidently affirm that they can divide gold and quicksilver into the four elements, yet for all that they speak not the truth. If two elements, fire and air, were thus taken away, all the rest must vanish into nothing. They may say that those two are retained, but they are, nevertheless, densely ignorant as to what becomes of them, for air and fire cannot be seen or perceived. Again, that extract which they call fire and air renders humid, which is not the property either of fire or of air. Moreover, as you have said, even the most learned doctor cannot know the proportion of each element in any given substance. For God has entrusted this knowledge to you alone. Nor is any sage wise enough to be able to mingle and put together the elements to produce any natural object. If then he dissolves anything into its elements, how, I pray you, is he to put them together again into any abiding form, since he is ignorant of their proportionate quantity and quality and of the method of their composition? Yet it is of no use to separate them if they cannot be put together again. To you, O nature, we must entrust this task, since you know the art of preparing the philosopher's stone, and of combining the elements without first separating them. Nevertheless, for the preparation of a true elixir, you need the aid of a wise and truly learned man. Aristotle says, where the physicist ends, there the physician begins. Nor can we attain to true alchemy until we begin to follow nature and be guided by a knowledge of her principles. Where the study of alchemy is rightly carried on, it is mightily advanced by nature. But for all that, we must not suppose that every natural substance must be useful to the alchemist. We must remember that alchemy has a threefold aim. First, to quicken and perfect the metal, and so to digest its spirit that none of it is lost. Secondly, so to digest and heat the substance in a small vial that, without the addition of anything else, the body and spirit are changed into one. The mingling of the elements is performed not by the artist, but by you. Thirdly, alchemy proves that the process of preparing the stone does not include any separation of the four elements, of the quicksilver and the sun, which is called red and glorious gold. To believe that such a separation must take place is a great mistake and contradicts the fundamental principles of philosophy. Again, it is an undoubted fact that every elementary substance is fed by the elements themselves. If that which now forms one object is dissolved, the object as such is destroyed, the bond which held the elements together being violently broken and each returning to that from which it was first taken. A father begets a son must not be destroyed for that purpose. It suffices that the generating spirit shall go forth with the seed, and be conceived by the female seed, and cherished with its warmth. Such a generating spirit has the power to beget an infant of the same species, as Avicenna says. Now, it is the same with pure gold, which is the true matter of the philosophical stone. For the father is the active principle, and must not be destroyed, or resolved into its elements 
but it is sufficient for the paternal son, gold, to breathe its virtue and strength through the mother into the son. When the mother, who is of the earth, brings forth the son, is seen to have the father's substance. Thus I have learned from you, O nature, that alchemy is a true science, and that the deep red gold, which is called sun, is the true father of the stone or elixir, from which the great and precious treasure proceeds, which heats, digests, and cunningly tinges, without the least diminution or corruption, the other principle of that gold. Thus brings forth so glorious a sun, it is worse than useless, therefore, to meddle with the composition or to separate the elements, which nature has so skillfully combined in the quicksilver and in the perfect body of gold. All we have to do is to imitate nature and use the instruments which she combines the elements, and which she uses in moulding minerals and in giving its form to the quicksilver. If we act otherwise, we destroy your works and sever the golden chain which you have forged. Nevertheless, we must, as Aristotle says, transmute the elements so that we may obtain the object of our search. Thus you have wisely led me into your way and have shown me the utter folly of my own doings. Unto you I render the most heartfelt thanks, for you have delivered me from my own ignorance, and from the disgrace and ruin to which all my endless alembics, quicksilvers, aquafortis, dissolutions, excrements of horses, and coal fires must at length have brought me. In future I will read your book more diligently, and obey you more implicitly, for this is the surest and safest way that a man can go. Because the art is entirely in your hands, although, because of its gigantic aim, its progress must necessarily be slow, therefore I will lose no more time and first begin to think about the substance, the active principle of which shall yield me the most potent quicksilver. That I will enclose in a clean, airtight vial, and under it I will place an alembic, Thereupon you will wait upon your office. From the bottom of my heart, I once more render unto you the debt of unspeakable gratitude, for you have deigned to visit me and to bestow upon me so precious an inheritance. In token of my gratitude, I will now do your bidding, and let it be my ceaseless aim to attain to this most glorious tincture of the elements, feeling assured that with the help of the thrice great and good God, I shall succeed. This concludes our reading of A Demonstration of Nature. If you have enjoyed this reading or have suggestions for future readings, please let me know in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe to be notified when new audiobooks become available. Bye for now.